Let's have a look at the subdivision of the neck into different cervical regions. Okay, so we can divide the neck as you can see here. I've taken the liberty to draw with a pen on the surface. We can divide it into four main regions. Okay, so you have the SCM or sternocleidomastoid region. You have the posterior cervical region, which is back here. You have the lateral cervical region and you have the anterior cervical region. The sternocleidomastoid muscle, which is going to be just deep to the skin here, actually, as you can imagine, will be defining the sternocleidomastoid region. This is important because everything anterior to it or anterior to the anterior border of it is going to be in the anterior region. Everything behind it or posterior to the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid is going to be the lateral region and of course posterior to the lateral region is going to be the posterior region. We need to remember also that the sternocleidomastoid has two heads, right? It's called sternocleidomastoid, which implies that it has an attachment to the clavicle and to the sternum. To illustrate this, see if I can get rid of this pen drawing and also if I can get rid of the skin for us. So here is the pen. I'm going to clear the 2D pen. Okay, the pen is gone now, and now I'm going to remove the skin. So now with the skin removed, I've actually superimposed in 3D pen the different regions again. And now you can see very nicely the sternocleidomastoid. And as I might have already stated, the name implies it has two attachments distally, which would be the clavicle down here and the sternum which would be over here. Actually, I have hidden the sternum, so the body of the sternum. However, the two heads are separated by a little space, as you can see right here. And this little space in between the clavicular and the sternal head of the sternocleidomastoid is actually called the lesser supraclavicular fossa. Now that we know that there are several regions in the neck, now we can dive a little bit deeper and uh, familiarize ourselves with the triangles of the neck as well. So the triangles of the neck are not going to be synonymous with the regions, although location-wise they are close. They're not the same thing though, okay? So to make this most descriptive, we can see that the posterior triangle yeah, is going to be bounded anteriorly by the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid right along here, and posteriorly by the superior border of the trapezius by these fibers that you can see right there, and inferiorly just by the middle one-third of the clavicle. So the roof or the superficial boundary of our posterior triangle, which really looks like a triangle here, would actually be uh, by the deep layer, yeah, or actually the investing layer of the deep cervical fascia. Yeah, and there's also a deep boundary, which would be the floor in that case, which are the muscles of the neck that then would be covered by prevertebral fascia, as you can see, you can look in here, that's where the deeper muscles of the neck would be. In contrast, you have the anterior triangle here, and the anterior triangle will be bounded by the midline of the neck, straight down here, also by the mandible, and by the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid. So this makes a neat little triangle, which we can then actually also subdivide into four smaller triangles as we move forward. But let's have a look at the posterior triangle first here. So if we have a look at the posterior triangle, we can actually also appreciate that we can subdivide this again to two smaller triangles. Uh, one of these would be the occipital triangle, as it is part of or within the posterior triangle. You can imagine that, well, one of the boundaries here anteriorly is going to be the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid, and the posterior boundary would be the anterior border of your trapezius, but then we have this little muscle here, which is actually the inferior belly of the omohyoid. Yeah, this will form the interior boundary. Yeah, so this would be your triangle here. So in that case, if this is called your occipital triangle, you would have another triangle down here, and that triangle is the omoclavicular triangle. Yeah, because omo from omohyoid, and clavicular because of the clavicle. So for the omoclavicular triangle, you would have the inferior belly of the omohyoid as the superior border, the clavicle down here as the inferior border, and this little sliver of the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid as the anterior border.
But for simplicity, I'm just going to refer to the general contents of the posterior triangle when we talk about what we can find in here. To illustrate some of the contents of the posterior triangle, I've actually had to go ahead and add some more features. So now we have some vascular features in here as well and some nerves. So we can see there's some part of the external jugular vein right here as it crosses the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid. You can find this within the um, posterior triangle. You can also find some of the branches of the cervical plexus of nerves over here. The one goes transversely across the sternocleidomastoid would actually be the transverse cervical nerve and you have other sensory nerves that are coming out of the so-called herbs point or the nerve point of the neck. You should also find the spinal accessory nerve as that is the one that innervates the sternocleidomastoid but also the trapezius. You will find your trunks of the brachial plexus down in here as they are moving into the brachium. You will find several cervical lymph nodes and also the so-called cervicodorsal trunk. And down here is the subclavian artery. Specifically, we will find the third part, so it has three parts, and we actually find the third part of the subclavian artery um, passing through the posterior triangle of the neck. So for completeness, why don't we have a look at some more of the nerves of the posterior triangle. I'm going to move this a little bit better into position. And we can see, highlighted down here, follow the mouse cursor, here is the spinal accessory nerve. And an important tidbit, if you do not know that yet, is, well, I always kind of call the spinal accessory nerve a cheater because it's not really a cranial nerve, right? Cranial nerve number 11 originates from neurons in the spinal cord segment C1 to C5. It doesn't come from the brain, it comes from the spinal cord. Okay, so the axons of these nerves or these neurons will actually leave the spinal cord, merge together, and ascend as a single nerve through the foramen magnum, which is the big hole in the skull, and then they will exit through the jugular foramen and pass downwards, and they will only supply, so the accessory nerve will only supply two muscles, one of which we see here, which is the sternocleidomastoid, and the other one is the trapezius. So accessory nerve, cranial nerve 11, actually comes from the first five segments of the spinal cord, and it only innervates two muscles. It is purely motor. It does not have any sensory function. Next in line, we actually have the cervical plexus. Okay, The cervical plexus is interesting. Now you can see some of it coming out from here. Yeah, as I said earlier, it's also called the nerve point of the neck or herbs point. And the cervical plexus, you can see some of the nerves here, yeah, uh, consists of the ventral rami of the cervical nerves one through four. Yeah, several of these branches you can usually see in lab. They're a little bit harder to dissect out. They're often accidentally removed together with the skin. Okay, but they appear posterior to the posterior border of the SCM, and if you are careful enough, you should be able to find some of these. Okay, you'll find, for instance, this one here, which is the transverse cervical nerve. This actually supplies uh, sensory innervation to the anterior triangle. See if I can highlight this one. This is your great auricular nerve, and actually auricle means ear in this context, so that'll actually supply skin of the ear and the parotid region. And then, let me see if I can highlight this one as well. This here would be the lesser occipital nerve, which is for the skin to the ear and the scalp. And then we would also have supraclavicular nerves that are radiating inferiorly here. They will supply skin around the chest and shoulder region. As an interesting little side note, what you can do if you're performing anesthesia, you can actually do a so-called cervical plexus block. Yeah, there will be a regional anesthesia of the skin of the neck by blocking the cervical plexus. So the main site of injection would in that case be just superior to the midpoint of the posterior border of the SCM. So just about here where the mouse cursor is now and administering an anesthetic over here would then knock out all of those branches of the cervical plexus.
So let's finish off the posterior triangle just by saying two or three things about the so-called brachial plexus. Uh, the brachial plexus will be dealt with at a different time and a, in a different lecture series actually because that is highly involved in the innervation of the upper limb. Okay, But in brief we can say this much, which is that the brachial plexus innervates all of your upper limb. Good. In addition it has several parts. It has parts that are called roots and trunks, but it also has divisions a little bit further down, and it has cords and branches. Okay, so there is a mnemonic, stands for Randy Travis drinks cold beer. So roots and trunks, divisions, cords, and branches. Okay, and it innervates all of the upper limb. So it has a lot of mixing and mingling that's going on between the fibers that originated from the spinal cord segments C5 all the way down to T1. So it's a large mixed plexus of nerves. One more thing about the posterior triangle in the context of the brachial plexus. We should note that the roots and trunks are above the clavicle, so they are supraclavicular, whereas the divisions are postclavicular, and the cords and terminal branches are just infraclavicular in position. So for anesthesia purposes, you can target the brachial plexus and you can inject an anesthetic kind of superior to the midpoint of the clavicle and you could do a supraclavicular brachial plexus block. Well, as we've now talked about the brachial plexus, there is actually one quite important triangle we should uh, not neglect as this is one where we can find the roots and trunks of the brachial plexus emerging. Uh, that would be the interscalene triangle. Okay, the interscalene triangle is going to be bounded by the uh, middle and anterior scalene muscles. So here's the middle scalene muscle, and here's the anterior scalene muscle, and down here by rib number one. Okay, so the triangle will contain your brachial plexus and also the subclavian artery. I've hidden that right now, but not the subclavian vein. And one clinical correlation about the interscalene triangle is that it could become too narrow if there was something there like a cervical rib, although cervical ribs don't really occur more frequently than in well, 0.5 to 1% of the population. Uh, if there was a cervical rib, that might actually compress the subclavian artery, which can lead to ischemia, so reduced blood flow to the upper limb. Also, as you can see, the brachial plexus is coming through the triangle here. You can imagine if there was an extra rib there, it could also compress the brachial plexus, which would then, of course, have its own detrimental effects on the innervation and functioning of the upper limb.